1931, Liverpool, England. The murder of Julia Wallace remains unsolved. The authorities appeared to have rushed to arrest their only suspect, Julia's husband, William Herbert Wallace. Their evidence was circumstantial at best, and built around the bizarre circumstances of William's activities for around the 24 hours leading up to the murder. This includes receiving a message to meet in R.M. Qualtro at 7.30 p.m. at a fake address. And upon returning from looking for this Qualtro, William seemed to have, quote unquote, put on a show of not being able to get into his home, in which was Julia's corpse. William H. Wallace's alibis are strange, and where we're picking up the story today is at his trial. This is A Study of Strange. Welcome back to the show. Part two of the murder of Julia Wallace. Norm Thoming, mystery and thriller writer who works under the pen name August Norman, is still here with me to complete the strange tale of mystery. Uh, thank you, everyone who tuned in for part one and the launch of this podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review. That is so, so important, and I'm thrilled and thankful for those that have already done so. Thank you so much. Research info is in the show notes and on a studyofstrange.com. All right, so let's get back into it then. And we're going to start right away with the trial. Super fun trial of William Herbert Wallace. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. <laughs> Probably. Do you, I, is it barristers in England? Is that what they call their? This is, uh, this is where you'll have to research this later. Oh, no. But I believe a barrister does trial and a lawyer does like deeds yeah yeah and i'm probably exactly wrong it's probably the opposite but right it's something right. like that regardless uh write in and tell norm why he's wrong at a, a study of strange at gmail <laughs> i'd love to hear your thoughts about how he's it can incorrect be what i'm something. wrong about for anything it yeah. doesn't have to be about this no just just that no other comments um so the prosecution gave a great opening statement if by the definition of great means a lot of lies because they are, they had a dozen false statements and the defense attorney did a great job of sort of poking holes in a lot of the things, including the fact that there was no motive. And the prosecution said, motives, we don't need no motive. Motives, motives five, like we know he did it. So why does it matter why he did it? And that was their, their point of view. Um, but if we actually look at what could have been considered motives, so in, in sort of spousal murders sure. that happen way too often, they should not happen at all, but they do happen. Uh, it's usually money, jealousy. What else? Like is it, hate. Like, hate. Just yeah. too many years and like mm -hmm. you're getting them at last one of these days. But don't you think there'd be some sort of evidence like neighbors through thin walls hear them arguing they from time, all the time to time? Not they played duets. Right. Right. Know. Which is what the Wallaces did mm -hmm. just for clarification. So, yeah, there are no there's no evidence to suggest that they ever didn't get along except for one thing. So they did find diaries. William Wallace kept a lot of diaries. Ah. And there was one, one mention of a fight with Julia. Uh, and I think it was over the fact that she bought too many newspapers. And it was years, years before the, the oh, murder. Oh, you never forget when they go all in on newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is the is the is the newsy dropping by too much? Why are we buying yeah, all yeah. these newspapers? Why are we buying all the newspapers? If what's the equivalent today? Is that like you're spending too much time on Twitter? Magazine like, subscription? Oh, I guess yeah, you're right. Yeah, not, yeah. not magazine subscription. <laughs> what am I ninety? <laughs> anyway, we get the new Red Book this week and the calls. <laughs> is Red Book still out there? Find it. Uh, write in. Let us know. Hey, Red Book, <laughs> at us. Uh. Yes. Uh, the process. Oh. I was reading the wrong line there. Uh, so they found the diaries. One one fight. However, in most of the rest of the diary, including more, more close in time to the murder, he spoke very highly of his wife, very lovingly of, of Julia. Yeah, just interesting that motive was they just kind of tried to blow it off. Also, how cool that some insurance uh, collector has a diary. He's keeping yeah. that journal. Yeah. You know, he's doing the artist's way. He's working through. 
He's working through his stuff. Well, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of their, their character. So uh, Julia was, she had a lot of clothes. I know that. Uh, she, I mean, she made clothes, but she like one of their bedrooms turned into her closet. Oh, yeah. Which which happens very often. In in the May family, it's normally the guys that uh, turn into giant closets. All right. the women. Um, and William was very interested in science and chemistry, and he actually had a lab in one of the other bedrooms. It was awesome. like his little like workspace to to build things and test things and do experiments. And he even gave talks on chemistry and stuff. So uh, they're very fascinating people. And they both, I think, read a lot. And obviously, music was it was a big part of their lives. Um, so there you go. There's some little side details to build the characters. Now, uh, Wallace was very calm and cool during the trial. And people thought he was too cool, too cool for school. The defense suggested that Julia, I'm going to bring back the Macintosh here for a second, the Macintosh raincoat, uh, suggested that Julia had worn the Macintosh to stay warm, opening the door for somebody, mm-hmm. maybe even the murderer. And she was she was sickly. She needed something to cover up with. It is England. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not the best weather. So she may have thrown it over her shoulders, open up the door, come in, attack happens, it falls on the ground. She also may have been holding it like in her lap if she sat down with somebody that's visiting her and attacked, falls over. There it is. Whereas I already spoke about in part one, how the prosecution suggested that the Macintosh was worn by Wallace as a shield for blood splatter because his real name is Dexter Morgan (laughs) and he understands blood splatter very well. There was a lot of talk about the time, the time Wallace left the house, the time he was seen on the trains and trolleys. Yeah. They have very precise numbers. Very precise. Again, I'm not going to go into that too much. So please, if you want to read that, check out the show notes. Um, The prosecution, here's where it gets a little interesting too. The prosecution said that the milk boy, Alan Close, Mm. who saw Julia at 645, they say that he saw Julia at 630. And it later came out that he was pressured from the police to say an earlier time than he actually saw mm-hmm. her. And he's a young boy. Like, I mean, he's going to get influenced by the by the cops in that. Um, luckily, one of the other delivery delivery boys, the one of the newspaper guys, stuck to his time about when he saw Alan Close delivering the newspaper. And uh, the defense did a good job about, like, really catching him in the act of saying the wrong time. Now, Wallace took the stand himself, which is usually frowned upon. Well, and, in the United States. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and prosecutors couldn't get much from him. He was just kind of like, he tried to answer their questions, but they were trying to trick him into things and he didn't really fall for any of it. And it's pretty cool because you can read all this. Like there is, there are all sorts of documents you can read to, to find all the quotes. Um, and it's really interesting. Now, the defense did a good job. William Wallace did a good job when he was up on on the witness stand himself, so much so that the judge, it seems, didn't think that he should be, uh, what is it, uh, not uh, tried, but caught, uh, accused, what is the- Right, the, yeah. He, caught, uh, caught guilty, at, what is the- Found guilty? Found, there we go, that's the all word. Right, all You're right, all right. You're all right, we Come don't on. know the, uh, the, the English uh, legal system. In America, we say caught guilty. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> forgive us for, yes, uh, apologies, please. Right. We also um, say elevator instead of lift. So, right. You know. And ooh, ooh, ooh. sorry, I got it here. I'm going to hand you. There's another, <gasps> Oh, this is <laughs> not, we're... this is not quite the same sort of, uh, reenactment. This is a little more true to form. Uh, you're going to play the judge. Yes. And I'm going to, why don't you do juror number two at the bottom of the page I as see. well? I see a few. Yeah. So. Here we are. This is a dramatization of the judge uh, talking to the court before the jury leaves for deliberation in the trial of William Herbert Wallace. So it's courtroom day. There's press, there's looky-loos, jurors, barristers, etc. crowd the courtroom. Wallace sits mouse-like feeble but stoic as the judge dresses the jury before they exit for deliberation. And I'm just going to assume that I have a wig. There is such an absence of any trace to incriminate anyone as to make it very difficult to say that it can be brought home to anybody in particular. If there was an unknown murderer, he was covered up his traces. Can you say it was absolutely impossible there was no such person? 
Or putting that aside as not being the real question, can you say, taking all the evidence as a whole, bearing in mind the strength of the case put forward by the police and the prosecution, that you are satisfied beyond reasonable doubt? That it was the hand of the prisoner and no other hand that murdered this woman? If you are not so satisfied, then it is your duty to find the prisoner not guilty. If you are satisfied equally, then it is your duty to find him guilty. Moments later, as the jury is moved into a room to deliberate, juror number two leans in to speak to juror number three. Did you see the way what Wallace was behaving? Yeah, he wasn't behaving exactly the way I think someone should behave in a traumatic situation I've never experienced personally. Right, you know what that means, don't you? Guilty! 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 Uh... And so uh, that's all. Those are all quotes, including the jurors. No, no, the, the judge is. That is really what he said. The jurors. We have to imagine. We have to imagine because after one hour of deliberation at 2.20 p.m., the jury found William Herbert Wallace guilty. Just in time for tea time. That's probably what they're aiming for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, I already have half the day. Yeah. Wallace anticipated being found innocent, allegedly. Um, but instead he got the death penalty. Yee. Mm-hmm. In May of 1932, however, the Court of Criminal Appeals acquitted William Wallace. They set him free because, in their minds, there was not enough evidence to convict. I mean, that's a quick turnaround, too, obviously. That's yeah, the yeah. May was the next year. So that's- Yes. Uh, it was very quick. And, if, uh, and I, God, I can't remember this exactly, but I think it may have been the first criminal like appeal acquittal in their their legal system i think uh i could be wrong on that but there's something there's something first of that right we're gonna say it is yeah uh and if you want to correct us you bring it (laughs) (laughs) you bring that correction you're getting snarky i like it yeah you bring it by phone here is this is a very short one but we are going to do a dramatization you're going to read what the uh the judge of the appeals court had to say now, this is a different judge. Yes, different. And they may not even call it a judge. I don't even know what they call him. Whenever you're ready. All right. I say the conclusion to which we have arrived is that the case against the appellant was not proved with that certainty which is necessary to justify a verdict of guilty. The result is that this appeal will be allowed and his conviction quashed. It is... A historic fact that Foghorn Leghorn did work in the UK for a matter of time before he moved to the States and uh, started his television career. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> I find the Southern judge of classic film to be my favorite judge. <laughs> I think we've gotten both my favorites tonight because it's the, the, the pompous wigged British one. And it's also the, the Southern one as well. So I've gotten both my favorites. tonight. thank you. Thank uh, you. Yes, I try. I try. William Wallace. He's, like you said, quashed. Quashed. He's out of there. He is a free man, and no other suspect has ever been arrested. So uh, what does he do now that he's free? I mean, obviously, first, fish and chips. And then, uh, second, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, I was going to say a duet, but no, it's solo. <laughs> a very sad solo. I was going to say, like, he's partying in Ibiza or something. Yeah. And, uh, but no. Chess uh, club. Chess club. Sadly, he... He did not have a very good life after this because, again, rumors, the rumor mill, a lot of people just thought he guilty. And if he's innocent, uh, his wife's dead. That's yeah, horrible. It's terrible. It's a, it's a terrible situation to be in. Uh, and he actually died just a few years later from some of the kidney ailments that, that he had been experiencing for a, a long time. A broken heart. Uh, now, before I get into some theories and suspects, is there anything you want to add right now? Any other questions before we get into some of that? I have... A fair amount of questions, but mm-hmm. I feel like you're gonna bring. I feel like you're gonna bring those answers. <laughs> I, I I feel like we know that they've gone back through people he worked with, other people with the the pre Rolodex uh, stone tablets. I don't know what they had in the thirties. It w- weren't no Rolodex. <laughs> uh, and for those of you who don't know what a Rolodex is, it's a rotary uh, system of paper cards where you write down phone numbers and then they list them alphabetically. Rolodex. Yeah. Look it up. Uh, buy stock on Rolodex, everybody. I hear it's coming back. Uh, <laughs> no, you actually mentioned you're, you're very good at this because you actually mentioned a few things that we are going to get into for sure, including the people that he may have worked with and uh, things of that nature. Um, there are some things I will share real quick that do point to his innocence. 
um, the time doesn't really make sense. So the trains saw him. Uh, and so we know when he had to leave his house. I guess that's my point. We know he had to leave right around 645, like he said. He was telling the truth about that. Right. Could someone else have worked for him to kill his wife? Sure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, there are transcripts with Dr. McFall, the the uh, medical examiner that, that had the wrong time of death, that says six, which they were always aiming for earlier because they wanted him home to kill Julia. But he does actually, in his transcript, say a few hours like six at the earliest but like eight at the latest right it's a range rigor mortis has it's, a, a certain amount of hours absolutely so even if his estimations are to be trusted which i don't trust him he still gives a big enough range that it could have happened after after uh wallace left his house uh most importantly the milk boy witness that is that's the big one because he saw julie he actually spoke to julia they talked about being sick because she was sick at the time. He sounded like he was congested. So she like inquired how he was feeling. I got a bit of the croup, I do, my lady. Mm -hmm. And that's a live recording of uh, what happened from back then. <laughs> so we actually got that. Um, and again, no motive. No motive that we, that we can actually justify right. or figure out. There are other suspects, the most famous of which is a man named Richard Gordon Perry. And I'm not the first to bring him up including probably multitudes of podcasts that have probably done this case, also bring up Richard Gordon Perry. He is uh, the usual suspect in this case of people that don't think William is actually guilty. Uh, he was not named publicly until, I think, the 1980s. No, that's um, much later. Yes, uh, but he was in books. Like People didn't know about him, but I don't think they ever said his name publicly until the 80s. Uh, and William Wallace himself named him to the police. Yeah. They asked right. him, they were like, could anybody have had a grudge against you or your wife? And this is the man he talked about. And we're going to get into Richard Gordon Perry. So he was named, I think one of the first times he was ever mentioned to the public was in John Goodman's book. Um, but he was called Mr. X. Now, John Goodman's book, this is like the preeminent, preeminent book on the subject uh, and is worth a read if anybody's interested in this case. Uh, he was younger than Wallace, and Perry worked as an insurance agent for the Prue as well. And in 1928, he met Wallace when Wallace was sick. Uh, again, they, they were sick a lot. Uh, and he helped kind of cover Wallace's work while he was sick in bed. So Perry was familiar with the Wallaces. He was familiar with their house because that's mm -hmm. where he would go to get the collection box, take it out, get the collections, bring it back, talk and, and work with William Wallace. Uh, at one point in time, Wallace noticed discrepancies in Perry's work. Perry said it was an oversight, uh, but there was still there were still issues. Basically, he was skimming. He was skimming mm -hmm. off the top, stealing money. Uh, Perry's father was wealthy. He was uh, in the treasury department of a local corporation, and it would have been embarrassing for him to have a son caught in a situation like this. And Perry did owe money, um, I think, to more more than one place like he he was not in a good situation in terms of stealing and owing and borrowing and not many people actually liked him at the prudential assurance office uh mainly because of these infractions that as would, that would do it you know, uh, now perry actually would come to the wallaces often and he would even admitted later in life that he would come and spend time with julia when Wal when william wallace wasn't there so they had become uh kind of friendly now the last time wallace saw perry was actually while Wallace was at the chess club. Perry was in the city cafe for a like a drama club. Like he was a member of mm, like a little sure. a little acting uh click, which I don't trust anybody that's ever <laughs> ever been an actor or involved with anything acting related. With good reason. Yes. Terrible, don't even let him park near the building. Yeah, I don't even I don't even let him sleep in my house. <laughs> <laughs> no. without two monologues one comedic <laughs> one dramatic every night before amy and i go to bed we do uh we do have to have a monologue for each other that's fair uh tonight i think i'm going to do something classic maybe some like Chekhov or something that you know, oh. some russian comedy i'd use one of these accents I'm just oh saying. for sure i mean i always go i always go <laughs> for foghorn leghorn when i'm doing Chekhov. now the <laughs> now uh I'll mode... say the cherry orchards are... <laughs> anyway i shot him <laughs> And that's what I remember of Chekhov. <laughs> that's all you need to know. Uh, no, I love Chekhov. It's one of my favorite playwrights. Anyway, uh, unlike William Wallace, Perry actually had a motive. And the motive is all this fraudulent activity and Perry owing money. And Perry knew where the lockbox was stored. 
in the house, in the kitchen on this top shelf. Yeah. He also knew that the lockbox <laughs> didn't usually lock. So right. it's not a it's not a hard theft to Well, it sounds like the door's locked. Oh yes, yes. Well, Meaning, yeah, you know, there you go. In an era when people often left the doors unlocked, mm-hmm. it was like, oh, we live with this neighborhood. Or, or were they locked or were they just stuck? Right. Or just, he just he was horrible having trouble. paint, a little yeah. lead paint. And now, uh, whew, sorry, now I lost my place again. Perry oh, took that lockbox. He took that lockbox. At least box. he knew where it was. Perry also knew that Wednesday was the day that Wallace would unload his collections at the office. So Tuesday night, which is when the murder happened, it's the night before all the money's going to disappear for the week. Richard Gordon Perry was engaged to a woman named Miss Lily Lloyd. I love how they always refer to her as Miss Lily Lloyd in right. a lot of what I read. And Miss Lily Lloyd gave comments to police that Perry was with her during the murder. So he had his own alibi. Now, when Wallace died, she actually changed her comments and went to the police and said that she lied, that he was not with her all evening. He wasn't with her till later in the evening. So he could have been out and about when the murder took place. And there's an affidavit that was never signed because Wallace was already dead at the time. And so they didn't like pursue it. Right. We're not going to dig this up because we already closed this. Exactly. When Perry told his alibi to the police being with Lily Lloyd, the police made no effort to actually check the alibi. Yes. But if we go check it, she's going to say yes, she's right? She's going to say yes. Yeah. All right. I don't yeah. have to get up. Yeah. You just tell me. Uh, as long as we're out of here before tea time. <laughs> uh, Perry, if we look at just some some characterization of Perry, uh, this is all after the murder, but he was arrested multiple times or charged with crimes multiple times, including uh, arrested in 1932. He was uh, charged in 1934 as well with driving away in a motor car without consent, which uh, is, is that just stealing a yeah, car? Yeah, it's Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, there you go. Uh, or and, that's what your rich father does when you take his car and he wants you to, he doesn't want a parent, mm-hmm. but he wants you back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in 1935, fraudulent, fraudulently embezzling. So just embezzling. Yeah, that's just, yeah. I just, I love how I wrote these down. I probably copied them from various things. Uh, and in 1936, a girl accused him of assault and Perry threatened to kill her. And he was uh, actually charged yeah. for this. Now, the outcome of this case, um, we actually, I couldn't find an outcome for the case, but I think it was acquitted or dismissed or settled. You know, someone paid off somebody, maybe. Um, John Goodman, the writer, uh, interviewed Perry in the 1960s on Perry's doorstep. Wow. And the radio interview that I use as sort of my main source for research that I will link to that the BBC did in the 80s, um, you actually hear John Goodman retell this, the story of interviewing Perry. And Perry knew all of the details, even after 30 years of the murder. He talked about visiting the house when Wallace wasn't there and being chummy with Julia. So she may have even let him in that night. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he kind of laughed at it at the same time. Now, I don't usually judge the way people act in these situations. I don't want to say someone's guilty or not just based on this, because it is a weird thing. Even if he's innocent, this Richard Graham Perry guy. Sure. You've still been you've still been thought of as the main suspect for a long time. It's a weird situation to be in. Yeah, and you also committed a bunch of crimes. Yes, yes. So you have a lot you have a lot to hide and or, and or say. It's not like he was accused then, and then his life went downhill, and then he had to commit a bunch of crimes or mm-hmm. committed a bunch of crimes because he was angry. It was, he committed a bunch of crimes, and then they're like, "Oh, he's a suspect." Yeah, yeah. So let's get into some some. Th- theorizing some some theories here and we're gonna come back to some perry here in a moment too i think the common theories i'll just do a little list here let's see uh common theory william wallace did it he set up everything he made the call as qualtro he set up all these alibis made sure people saw him out and about uh another theory richard gordon perry who i just introduced he did it um and he may have also been qualtro to get william out of the house uh and also, I did I did mention that he, they saw each other at the city cafe, yes, right? Yeah, because of so, the drama club. Exactly. So at the drama, the when William Gordon Perry was with his drama club, there was the schedule for chess matches were actually printed on the board. As you do. So he could have seen that William Wallace was scheduled to be there on Monday and, you know, that kind of thing. So he may have actually been able to know that he would be there. Uh, there another theory. There is another gentleman named Marsden who was friends with Perry, who was also caught in stealing and skimming money. Um, so some people theorize that he could have done it just for time's sake. I'm not going to go into him as well. I think Perry is a little bit better of a suspect. Some people also think that they may have worked together to do it, Sure. which I do think actually is, is a very interesting theory. Um, 
there's also theories that William Wallace, I can't talk, excuse me, <laughs> William Herbert Wallace hired Perry or Marsden or both to do it while he was out. But again, no motive. Yes, exactly. Uh, lastly, one that I find very intriguing is there had been a string of murders in the or murders. Oh, that's that's. Lastly, everybody was getting. <laughs> oh, there was a serial killer. Everybody, working the everybody was murdering everybody at the time well, on true. on their avenue. His name was Blunt Force Trauma. <laughs> hit him on the side of the head. Doctor Doctor Blunt Force Doctor Trauma. McFalls. Um, no, no, no. Sorry, there were a string of thefts that were happening in the area. And what was really interesting that I didn't, re- when I was reading about this, I would come across this a bit and I don't, I can't remember which book I read it in, but one of the most compelling aspects about these thefts is that the doors were locked. So they didn't break a window. They didn't like, they came in, right. stole things, came out. They picked locks. Locked the door. Picked the lock or, as I also found, uh, a lot of the neighbors that lived in that row, the, you know, all the, whatever you call it, the row houses, uh, the keys would, were not super good. That makes sense. And you can actually open your neighbor's homes, right. doors very easily with those keys. Yeah, I mean, in those days, the a skeleton key was actually a, a right. thing. And that could have been the thesis as well. They could have had some sort of skeleton key right. they stole or copied or, you know, whatever. What, 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 you're, yeah, no, that's yeah. a... But yeah, the idea of, of it could be the neighbors that... Uh, yeah. Uh, there actually is a theory. Um, the gentleman, or I say gentleman, it may even be a woman. I, I apologize for assuming... Uh, someone has a website, WilliamHerberWallace.com. A lot of great say That's where the crime scene photos I'm showing you are. Um, that person that runs that site has a theory that the Johnstons, the next door neighbors, actually did it. Because uh, they were tired of the music. It's so much music. Uh, have you ever lived I hate next violins. Musicians? If only they could play a French horn instead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, they uh, there. So there is a theory with that, which I won't get into because I actually just don't believe it. They had relatives in their house and stuff like. I just, it just seems uh, too out there for me. But there are some interesting facts that you can look up. Um, now I'm going to go back to Richard Gordon Perry because he is the the top suspect. If you don't believe William Wallace did this himself, because right. a lot of people still do. Uh, Perry, I actually think Perry could have done it as well. He seems he seems like the type. I don't want to just stake, put a stake in that a flag. I don't want to put a flag a in that. A flag in that hill. Uh, I don't want yes. to put a stake in that vampire. There you go. That's the metaphor. Yes, uh, that's what I'm going for. But uh, he, he, he is a, a very likely suspect for, for very, very good reasons. However, one thing that came about is that his alibi, which I mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, his girlfriend had lied about it, he actually had another alibi. So a woman, let me look up her name, Olivia Brine, a woman named Olivia Brine said that Perry and other friends were at her house on the night of the murder from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m., Mm -hmm. which is when the murder would have happened. Which is then Lily, Miss Lily was like, he wasn't here until like 8.30. Yeah, yeah. I think she said 9 or 9.30 that he showed up at her place. Um, So a lot of people question, though, well, if he was there, why didn't he say that? Why didn't Lily know about that? I actually think we don't know the relationship with Olivia. Maybe he was kind of keen on Olivia and didn't mm-hmm. want to mention her name around Lily. So he just said he was, you know, out and about or whatever. Um, I would also like to mention just because I do think he is a likely suspect, even with that, that alibi, that alibi came about later and witnesses, as I'm sure, you know, are not, they're not great. <laughs> I mean, they're not. And even that clocks weren't great. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we didn't have like crystal, uh, yeah, crystal in our watches. Like yeah. there wasn't, there wasn't even. What is it now? Uranium. It's not uranium. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you're listening <laughs> to this in the future, obviously it is. Uranium. Plutonium watches uh, are fantastic. I, I don't know all the things about watches, but I know, like you know, in America, we didn't even have time zones until a certain year, and it's later than you think. You yes, know, it yeah. definitely is that. Like, oh, what time is it? Yeah. How do you set a clock? Yeah. So, uh, time, and also, not everybody had a watch. Right. This isn't depression. Not everybody had a pocket watch or a wrist watch. Right. Or... And the church tower may not be yeah. exact. Exa- and you may not see it clearly. And, and um, yeah, so so time is definitely something to question in this alibi. And the other, again, is just witness testimony. People misremember things all the time. Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't take a lot of stock into that, but it is worth noting, obviously. It is an important aspect to bring up. So my comment... Um, so all this is that Perry is a a likely suspect. Sure. Um, the fact that he wasn't ruled out then is ridiculous. 
It is. It is. That is that is that's the biggest aspect of it, because he could be innocent as well. But the fact that the police didn't pursue this, even after William Wallace mentioned him by name, is it's a travesty. It really is. Now, here's where I'm at. Just a couple just a couple thoughts. Uh, I think this was an act of more panic than like passion. I don't see this as being a premeditated murder. I see it more as the evidence in my eyes lines up as a premeditated theft, which is why Gordon Perry, in my mind, is a likely suspect because right. he knew where the lockbox was. None of the other drawers and cabinets and things were like torn open or gone through. It seemed like whoever was there went straight for that lockbox. There was a cabinet that was kind of broken. I think the cabinet could have been broken. His lockbox was up high. You have mm -hmm. to climb on some things to get to it. Lockbox might fall. I assume a lockbox a little heavy. A little, a little heavy. it might be. Yeah, it's like heavy metal kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, so I think it was a, a theft gone wrong. And either Julia was, they normally didn't use the parlor themselves. They would hang out in sort of this, what they called the middle kitchen, because there was also a back kitchen. Nice. But it was very much, I, I mainly, all my knowledge from this comes from, um, Oh, God, why am I forgetting the name of it? Downton Abbey. <laughs> so in, in a lot of the, the homes there, you kind of hung out in the kitchen. There's like, you know, the stove to keep warm and you would sit at a little table oh. or chairs by the stove. Nowadays, most of us hang out. In the we kitchen. also still hang yeah. out in the kitchen. That's a good point. Um, so I think that was like their living room kitchen. And but they did have a back kitchen that they would probably use for bigger meals or whatever. They probably didn't even use it very often because they don't want to get kitchens. Well, it's more of like just a stove. Right. Okay. So it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's like there's no microwave right. and dishwasher and stuff like that. Your clothes in the back yeah. kitchen. Yeah. In fact, I think that is where they wash their clothes was in the back kitchen. Mm -hmm. Good call. Very mm -hmm. smart man. So anyway, I think the the parlor aspect is really interesting because if the theft is going on and she didn't use the parlor unless she had guests, I think she let somebody in that she recognized. That's why she was in the parlor. She would have lit the fireplace mm -hmm. for the guests, maybe even the gas lamps above, and. I kind of think someone else, I think it was more than one, because I think she may have heard something from the kitchen. So the person with her panics hits her with something heavy there. She, I actually think she fell into or like bounced off kind of the fireplace. Mm -hmm. People can't visualize what I'm doing at home, but sort of st not fall in, like topple over into the fireplace. But yeah, like, when he does it, though, it's like, it's amazing. It's <laughs> very obviously the answer. <laughs> wow. Sound effects. I know she falls into the fireplace and he, someone either pulls her off or she falls backwards. She's holding or wearing that Macintosh because it was cold outside when she let it in the person. Exactly. It falls on the ground. She falls on top of it. Um, whoever killed her might have moved her too. might have moved her away from the fire because the bottom of the dress and bottom of the Macintosh were slightly burnt. Right. So it may have been starting. Some people, not even some, a lot of people suggested the murder tried to burn things to like burn the Macintosh, sure. like burn evidence. I'm like, that's going to create, it's a, it's a, a horrible smoke. I mean, yeah. You, horrible gonna, smoke. You have to burn the house down. Yeah. And it's like, you can't, no, I think, I think she was wearing it and it got, whoop, I think it got slightly singed in the fireplace. Makes more sense. Before she fell. That makes way more sense to me. And the lights were off when William Wallace came home. So I think whoever killed her probably to just kind of tidy up and make sure no one sees anything outside, anything like that. I think they turned off the lamps. Right. And skedaddled. <laughs> uh i also think they may have locked the front uh the bolt on the front door because in case william wallace is coming home or someone else heard something sure. they want to make sure that is that is blocked from anybody coming in because that's right by the that's parlor where the body is and they went out the back now uh this is why i mentioned at the, the top of part one i think that i think the big crux in this case is the locked door and at first i kind of blew it off for a long time right it's just a cool thing but Wallace's key worked, not the first time, but the second, like it worked, it worked easily. And even if doors get stuck, which some say the back door of their house would get stuck, it's his door. People know I have doors that stick. I know yeah, the yeah, little, yeah. I know you the tricks. Typically know like how to hold it down and then push it. Yeah. In. Yeah. Push up, pull in, pull out, jiggle the key, you yeah. know, whatever. There's little tricks. None of that comes up in any of the, the interviews or comments or court case. Um, just said it, it just says it was it wouldn't open and instead he tried the front again and then went back to the to the back where the johnstons were so bizarre cases like this even i'm even going to use jack the ripper as an example mm -hmm. um time makes things harder the more Obviously. time we get away the harder it is and facts disappear and they shift over time 
uh, if we knew why Wallace couldn't open his doors, that's like the time travel thing in my mind. Right. Like, obviously, seeing who did it would be easier. <laughs> but if you couldn't do that, I just want to see him try to get in the house and be like, wait, why, what is he doing? Right. Why aren't these doors opening? Right. And I also feel that that's the thing. It's like, your neighbors are right there. Have them try the door. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. it's obviously not opening. Yeah. yeah. That, that is a strange one. That is... um. And, and did they even get into, like, uh, are there locked windows? Not that I'm aware of, no. Because it's literally that thing yeah. of, like, do they, lock, do they lock the doors and then go out the window just for... I, I, that's that's a question. And and I don't, th- I don't think those windows open, just having seen pictures of the place. I actually don't think there's a way to get out the windows, at least on the bottom, the ground sure, floor. Sure, sure. Um, and also, it's real houses. So there's not many. There's just, like, the front sort of window right. they probably didn't have a sachet or whatever it probably wasn't a yeah so anyway that is that's my big point and i wish that was more dramatic i wish i was like perry did it or william wallace did right. it. right but i do want to end on because i feel like people don't talk about the locked door aspect of this enough i feel like there's more information about the locked doors and what was going on and why couldn't he open it because if he was pretending boom that proves his guilt yes if it was locked all those times because he went back and forth right so if the front door has the bolt on it that's why i can't get in back door is locked when he goes around and he can't open it maybe there's a maybe there's a bolt we don't know about or something that keeps it that someone else on the inside has to open when he goes back to the front that's when the whoever did it could have still been inside and escaped out the back right and that's why it was open he could open it the last time he came around which means the murderer could have still been in there right. when he got home which then points back to the neighbors no, i'm kidding except no i mean that's part <laughs> of could, that's part of the theory of the neighbors is that the reason they were back there the last time he went is because they could have been coming out right because yeah. they hadn't been out in the garden but then they're like oh we're on our way somewhere uh, and, and again, also were they cleared was then whenever i mean now you, you saying it out loud actually makes it sound better than what i'm reading about it because they also were going to a relative's house and the relative was questioned by the police and the relative said i wasn't expecting them yeah. Ooh. I mean, it's nice that they Ooh. cleared it. It's that kind of thing. You're like, maybe it didn't make the documentation because it was so obviously cleared, but probably not based yeah. on their other yeah. work. Yeah. Um, and again, the time. I mean, at the time, how many police officers would the Liverpool Police Department even have? I, you know, I don't know. And then how many investigators? Know. How many of those would actually be investigators as opposed yeah. to just constables? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um it was, just, it was a very different time where, uh, you know, crime was really just like, oh, that guy did it. He's running away with the thing in his hands. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's uh, or worse or much well, worse. I mean, if you think about it, we kind of it's it's still kind of the same. You, I mean, because you especially with a murder, because you have to be without, a, you know, without a doubt. It has to be like full bore. You have to really believe this person did it. Otherwise, we should not convict him yeah. or her. Um and nowadays we just have modern technology to help. We have security cameras. We have, you know, fingerprints. Was it ahead back then too? But better technology around fingerprinting and DNA. And I mean, DNA is a huge game changer in the whole criminal. But especially world. cameras with GPS, uh, yeah. phones with GPS, yeah. just the tracking of our everyday lives, uh, which is interesting because this case actually has parallels to. Uh, the Pam Hupp story, Ooh. which uh, the Hulu has yeah. the uh, special right now. Yeah. The, truth, the thing about Pam. But literally they did uh, some one of the accusations uh, against the husband was that he might have done it naked in yeah. just slippers. I forgot about that. And you're like, oh, wow, that's literally what they said about yeah. this guy. He might have done it naked in the Macintosh oh to avoid. God. And then there was no evidence of blood cleanup. Yeah. Same thing. It was like a hundred years later. Like, yeah, that's crazy that that's still like, maybe they did this or like maybe, yeah. but that's really far from the obvious. I forgot about that. Yeah. That is so it's, true. Uh, it's amazing that, I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's almost forgivable that something in 1931 uh, wasn't policed to the, to the extent mm-hmm. that we would expect mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I know so many more cases um where police were just downright awful this one as much as i kind of made fun of them tonight they actually did kind of try to do their job it's just i think the time of death i think the medical medical examiner was the big problem in this um and also just the speed they should have just taken a a wee bit more time to kind of think about things but they did they did try they weren't purposefully just moving on to things they i mean that's they kind of were now that i say (laughs) um it's hard to know because it's that idea of like like you said wallace has if 
if you're, no, we're not going to kill our wives, but if you're going to kill your wife and you know it, and you plan this whole alibi, still, what's the way you, and you want to make it look like a robbery, do you still get that bloody, like, uh, was that just the accident? Like, you thought one swat to the head would do it, and then all of a sudden it broke, broke open a blood vessel and or a major artery and blood started spattering everywhere, I guess? It just seems like a stretch. And then literally, if they did check for blood cleanup, well done. Congratulations, especially those days. But yeah, the fact that they didn't find any on site means they had to find it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's it, this one's a doozy. And, and again, this one is kind of more popular than I'm trying. I'm trying to find stories and cases of weirdness that not everybody knows that doesn't have a million podcasts and documentaries and stuff about it but this one it it is so strange and it's so fascinating and again my mind when i really dove dove into this and was like i'm gonna do this as an episode i didn't think my opinion would change because there were there are moments where i think william wallace actually did it sure and i also uh I'll, i'll bring up this too before some final comments or thoughts and we end here soon in a minute um one thing that did occur to me that i never had thought about in all the years I had been kind of reading and fascinated with this case, the Qualtro call. Not everything has to be connected. What if that is completely unrelated to the murder? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't part of it at all. And it, that could have been Perry as well, because he knew where he would have been. Perry, I could easily see is like, I'm going to prank Wallace or whatever and like send him out on a right. wild goose Dinner chase. Dinner time, send him yeah. across town. And um, old man with bad kidneys. Yeah. And and look, I'm not saying it isn't related. I'm just saying we shouldn't connect it just to connect it. Right. Just because it's so off. Yeah. So avert. Yeah. So I don't know. Just just that thought. Are there any other theories you have or any thoughts you want to you want to get out that are bouncing around? the? I mean, obviously McFall. Yeah. I feel like McFall's the the killer. He is the the medical examiner who always had it in uh, for (laughs) probably for the wife. Yeah. uh, Yeah. You know. Same thing. He's like, I'll make this sloppy as heck. So, uh, no, I think, um, yeah, it, uh, sadly, uh, I mean, obviously Perry sounds like the story. It sounds like the yeah. story behind the story. And it's like, well, that fits all of the, the boxes you would expect. Yes. Someone who ends up in a life of crime, if they mm-hmm. hadn't had a life of crime beforehand. Um, someone who literally had been accused of stealing by the guy who gets murdered. Um, and, and, the lack of taking even the cash that was there is, is interesting um, because there wasn't that much missing, right? It was only like, it was four pounds was mixing out of the, out of the, the tin, the lockbox, the but, money upstairs that wasn't missing. I kind of don't think that the killer went upstairs. I think something happened downstairs. The murder happens. They panic again. Just, just me, right, my opinion, out the back door. happy to be wrong. And is either stuck inside and trying to figure out their way out. I just, I don't think they intended to kill her. I think they intended to take the money and run. And I right. think they got the money kill her and then it's like oh, oh ah, ah, yeah 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 ah, ah, let's get the hell out of here yeah um so i don't think they ever went upstairs which is why i don't think that money uh was taken and it does seem again if there's that much blood there are no footprints in the blood mm-hmm. uh there's no footprints dragging blood right again are they naked you know probably, yeah yeah probably not yeah and i also uh i also don't know if they would have been completely covered in blood the way the investigators back then just immediately were like, oh, there's so much blood. Whoever killed her would have been bloody. Yeah, yeah. I think, de- ooh, I just hit my mic. Uh, I think depending on where they were when they hit her, and there's so much blood against that wall, and right. this is where like the Dexter Morgan thing comes in. There's nothing that seems to block that splatter, right? Right, there's no so shape like, of a person. Yeah, they're like, just oh, like, oh, my face. Um, so I don't know if they'd be covered in blood. I do think blood would have ended up on them somewhere, but I don't think they'd be like carry... <laughs> drenched in blood walking out of the house right not to mention at this point um i mean i know it's the it's up there it's north of where we are mm-hmm. but as far as what time sundown is sun is sunset around eight uh so it, it was winter right no yes yeah. well September, i mean i mean yeah, later right. in the year so it's not super long days they there's a lot of talk in the in this case about were the lights on or off when the milk boy delivered the milk because if they were on, whoever killed her may have been inside already with her. 
and the lights were not on. But the fact that they were even asking that makes me think it does get kind of dark kind right. of early there, um, at least at that time of the year. Um, yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. I, I mean, hadn't, I hadn't in thought an, about in that a lot. time with no light pollution, practically. Yeah, I yeah. guess uh, everything does get pretty dark. It does. It does. Um, well, cool. Well, uh, before we take off, yes, yes. Is there first? Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for bringing your insight, your accents. Thank you. Lovely that's accent. Mark. My major contribution. Yes, that is. It's really important to this whole podcast. Um, you didn't solve the case. I Not, was hoping you would solve the case. For you me. know, I did, uh, and I made an arrest. And their great, great, great grandchildren are are really mad at me. But I mean, aren't they happy that that justice is served? I think so. I don't care about my great great grandparents. Yeah. 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 Uh, they were probably. I don't know. I got Germans and then, I don't know, we lived in both the South and the North. So there's probably not a lot of great people in there. <laughs> no offense to any of those people. Uh, same with me. We may be related, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. No, thank you so much. This was this was great. I really thought your your interest in this kind of stuff and, and even your experience as a writer and coming up with, you know, mysteries and thrillers would be helpful. More helpful than you were, to be honest. Oh, well, uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm saving the good stuff for the books. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, but no, I, I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. And I apologize. The studio is so hot. Oh, you Peter. know, uh, <sighs> it's just the amount of excitement we have for this time. <laughs> it's true. The air conditioner is blasting. Yeah, we were yeah. so excited. I mean, we were <laughs> Sitting on ice cubes. <laughs> yes. Uh, is there anything you want to plug before we take off? Oh, sure. You can find all of my books and my writing and upcoming news at augustnorman.com. Uh, I write modern crime thrillers uh, revolving around a female journalist from Los Angeles named Caitlin Bergman. So feel free to check them out. And I also plug uh, other writers uh, all the time on my uh, mailing list. So, you know, so drop mailing. on by. Call him Don't at call his stuff, email address. Yes. Uh, and also, uh, are you guys still doing uh, opening night at all? Uh, I'm also a comedic improviser in the city of Los Angeles. And right now we're, we're getting back toward. Are you? Oh, I'm good. Not, oh, nice. But I'm, yes, I've been performing uh, with opening night, the improvised musical since 1998. I wasn't even alive. Yes. I was, <laughs> why? I was still evading uh, murder trials in the UK. Um, but no, no. Uh, you know, the comedy world is coming back after the pandemic. We hope to uh, see you all out there sometime. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And that concludes our study of the murder of Julia Wallace and the official first few episodes of A Study of Strange. Thank you all for listening. If you'd like to hear more, please subscribe wherever you listen to pods, rate and review. We're going to bring you new episodes weekly. Visit astudyofstrange.com for more information and to find our Patreon page where you can access additional exclusive content, including news of strangeness and upcoming interviews and mini-sodes. We're just starting up, but there will be a lot of content on there very soon. Find us on Instagram, visit our sponsors. We literally cannot do the show without you. And on that note, please also reach out to a study of strange at gmail.com. I'm hoping to do follow-ups, listener ideas, and create episodes involving fans in the near future. Tune into our next episode about spirit photography with special guest and my former co-host on autobiography, Tim Donahue. He doesn't like spooky stuff, but he put up with me. So, you know, he's got that going for him. Till next time. <laughs>